Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. We're here today in the Mercury Library on Insight New Mexico to talk with Albuquerque native and Highland High School graduate Tony Monfiletto, who is the founder of the wonderful Amy Beale High School uh, in downtown Albuquerque and also the founder now of, of the Leadership High School Network in Albuquerque. We'll be talking about three schools that they operate. Uh, one is the Architecture, Construction, and Engineering, or ACE High School, uh, I'm sorry, Leadership High School, the Health Leadership High School, and the Tech Leadership High School. Tony has described himself as a social entrepreneur, uh, and he sees the role of the Leadership High Schools as to prepare the way uh, for students from neighborhoods without the capacity to provide uh, pro uh, professional network opportunities. Um, as he said, he sees his schools um, as a way to cross the education and poverty divide by framing their purpose um, to, uh, uh, to be a client-driven uh, organization, uh, to meet the needs of both industry and the community, a connection of two parts of our world uh, which are um, seldom able to interact. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, VB. It's really great to be here. I appreciate the chance to talk to you and your viewers about uh, what we're up to with the Leadership High School Network. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention first. The first thing is that uh, our schools are, um, I'm the co-founder of, of these schools, so we a lot of people, we engage a lot of folks in the development process. Yeah. So it's me and other people, and I really think of myself as being one of the team yeah. um, that develops the schools. The second thing is that our, our, um, our schools are a loose network, actually a tight network of commonly um, derived and operating in similar ways but they're all autonomous schools and we serve as a hub of a network. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually run the schools, we just connect them. And that's important because the we think that the hierarchy um, really gets in the way of innovation. Uh -huh. So our schools are autonomous, they are responsive to a board, they have CEOs that run them and those those schools have a responsibility to be responsive to their own communities and as opposed to being responsive to a central authority. And that's a super important idea. If you want to have schools that are able to turn on a dime, be responsive, meet the needs of their community, then they really need to be local and run by their own CEOs and responsive to their own boards. Now we have a lot of affinity um, between the schools and reasons to collaborate and reasons to innovate together. And that's really the power of the network is it's voluntary and people are in the network because they believe in the ethos and the values that we have in the network. Could you explain to us a little bit about the ethos and the values of that yeah, network? I absolutely. think that would be wonderful to hear. So when the schools were founded, we believe that there are three principles or three pillars of school design that needed um, to be used in helping students. And the three pillars or the three des design elements for the schools are learning by doing. So we have a lot of kids in this town that need experiential learning. They need to get their hands dirty. They need to experience a relevant learning environment. They're really stuck when they're in um, didactic instruction, rows of kids, you can't get out of your seat. That kind of thing is really punishing for a lot of young people and they're capable, but the environment that they're asked to learn in doesn't um, fit their needs. So a learning by doing strategy, project-based, super relevant learning is one pillar of the school. So we're really appealing to kids who need to get their hands dirty and experience learning. The second pillar is a 360 degree degree support pillar. When, and what that means is we think of kids as assets. We don't think of them as problems to be solved. We think of them as assets to be nurtured. And that that means treating them in ways where you're mentoring, nurturing, um, developing them, and, and you're providing support that, um, that can supplement that nurturing, things like counseling, um, other kinds of services, 
that help kids um, get their needs met so that they can learn. It's a super important element of the school. And then third is community engagement. So as I mentioned, our job is to be responsive to our own communities. And so the community engagement pillar or values of the school is really about being able to um, listen to the community, take that input, metabolize it, and then do something with it. It's, it's one th- a lot of folks are good at taking input. They're not so good at using it oh to changing their way that they um, behave or the way that they operate. And so the community engagement work, engaging kids in the community, engaging the community in the school, being able to listen and be responsive, it's a super important um, element of the design. So perhaps if we could talk about how that operates um, in the A. CE Leadership High School, uh, which is Architecture, Construction, and Engineering. I know that you're dealing with a, with a lot of professionals, and but, mm-hmm. I'd, but I'd like to get a, a clearer picture of exactly what, what goes on. So at ACE Leadership High School, which stands for Architecture, Construction, and Engineering, the goal is to have the school feel like a job site or feel like a design oh. studio. So the school is organized around projects as opposed to around classes. So students enroll in projects and they earn their credits through project work and they earn and they master a certain set of skills, knowledge, attributes that it takes to be ready to work in the architecture, construction, and engineering field. So the folks who run the schools, which which is not me, but I was one of the co-founders of the school, but the folks who run the schools are really deliberate about understanding from employers and the community what does it take to graduate and be ready to transition into college and work or apprenticeship in that case? Uh So if you um, graduate from the school, you've demonstrated through exhibition, so actual demonstrations of learning that you can solve problems and meet a client's needs, um, be a creative thinker, work on a team, those kind of things that employers are saying is the future. So at ACE Leadership, we don't really train kids in a narrow skill set. So we're not there to teach kids how to weld or saw straight or measure or put up scaffolding. They know how to do that, but that's not the intent. The intent is to make them adaptable, thinking, problem-solving young people that can enter a company and add value and be vertically mobile, horizontally mobile. That's the Uh, that's our commitment to the employers because that's what they want and that's our commitment to the families that they're not going to be we're not going to be training kids for jobs that aren't going to exist in you know the the near future because the world's changing so fast so if you have a community uh, let's say and you have a potential employer and you have have a bunch of students who are going to who are going to enter this really interesting probably very high high power curriculum what are some con- concrete examples? I think I'm still a little fuzzy. So a good example would be um, a project that the school did with the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And so there was a, a, re- um, a uh, silvery minnow yes. restoration project right. in, the South, in the South Valley on the Rio Grande. And the... Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service came to the school and said, look, we'd like to build a bridge and and a kiosk and do some public educating around the Silvery Minnow in the South Valley. Would you like to partner with us? Or maybe we sought them out. I'm not sure how the relationship happened. And so the students designed a bridge. They they, walk uh, uh, on a footpath, a walking bridge. They built the bridge. They built a kiosk that taught people about um, the Silvery Minnow, and it's a restoration project um, on the Rio Grande, south of Albuquerque. So you said um, b- before the interview that that really the thrust is is improving communities. Um, mm-hmm. Could you expand on that a little bit? And uh, I believe you said you had 400 to 500 students, so you're into a lot of different communities. So ACE Leadership High School is located in the sawmill neighborhood of Albuquerque. It's a a community that's um, under some uh, revitalization now, but has had a long history of need. And so the school's located in in the sawmill district, and it's a partnership with the Associated General Contractors. 
the associate general contractors really was concerned about their pipeline of young people coming into the profession and the fact that it's a very sophisticated problem solving set that you need to have to work in architecture construction engineering so we're it's really an example of of great corporate social responsibility that the Jane's Corporation, Bradbury Stam, all those folks that came to support the school's development um really saw that the education system working upstream was really um um in the was really the way that they were going to get themselves out of their pipeline issues. So it's a great example of corporate social responsibility, I think. Then the second school um, will be in the South Valley. It's in a temporary location near the airport now, but it's Health Leadership High School, and it's going to be in the South Valley in a partnership with First Choice Healthcare, where it's going to be co-located with First Choice Healthcare. And First Choice really thinks about... Um, Healthcare in a in a much broader sense, so it's not really healthcare; it's the health of the community, mm -hmm. and so the school is part of the fabric of a healthy community. So a school where young people know about the social determinants of health, they understand the systems of care, how clinics and hospitals operate, the way that insurance works, and then thirdly, how to care for a client. and And so the schools are really developed with this idea that. Um, we need long-term solutions, human capital, long-term solutions to improving um, the community. And so First Choice and UNM Health Sciences Center, um, Presbyterian Healthcare, and I'm sure I'm leaving out some folks that have been super um, involved with the development of the school and work on a daily basis helping uh, the school understand what the skills, knowledge, and attributes are of the future health sector worker and so that when those young people graduate they're vertically mobile horizontally mobile able to make an impact improve their whole community the third school is technology leadership high school yeah, right, right. and that has a special uh place in my heart I, I grew up in the southeast heights very close to where the school is going to be permanently located which is trumbull park yeah. and so we're working with the city to acquire a piece of um, land that the city owns in Trumbull Park that has been uh, really, I think, a missed opportunity uh, for the community. It's just a seven-acre parcel of land that really needs some um, TLC and some investment. And so we've been working very hard with uh, PNM, and PNM has been helping us with an energy curriculum. So students are going to be working on battery storage and uh, opportunities of solar energy through that. Mm. Then um, Sandia Labs and some other folks at the Stimulus Center, for example, CNM Stimulus Center, around um, cybersecurity, and so we're building out curriculum in partnership with those folks. Um, it's a really exciting time because the I've been so impressed with the uh, employers at their interest in reaching out to young people that aren't the traditional success stories in school, mm -hmm. but are very capable. They're just not built for that five period day, you know, yeah. isolated, disconnected curriculum. Um, and instead, they need a, a real experience, a real reason to go to school, a nurturing, caring place to be, that kind of work. So we all talk, we also talked a little bit about the, uh, the central reframing of education that your enterprise and all the schools and the network and everybody else is concerned with. It's a whole different way of looking. Mm -hmm. at education. I think you just sort of touched on it a little bit, uh, but could you expand that a little bit more? There's a shift in the in really the frame in two ways. The first is the model that I described, which is uh, around learning by doing, 360 support, and community engagement, and that they're all equally important to preparing a, a young person to graduate. So it's the... It's the uh, ability of the institution to be highly effective in those three areas to meet a young person's needs. So that's a different kind of school than what we have now, which is very uh, complicated, but very predictable, right? Like, you know, it's first period, second period, third period, like, you know, everybody knows what that looks like. Well, this is a rethinking of that institution. Um, it's a new mental model for school. 
So that's, that's one reframing. The second reframing is really about, is really more about governance and really democratic principles. And I say that um, because what I'm talking about is schools are located and driven by local community input. So it's not a school that, they're not schools that are organized toward a central authority, a command and control system, where you're following the orders given down from the central office or Santa Fe or wherever those um, central authorities are. Instead, they're pointed out to the community and they're designed to be responsive to the folks who are their clients, which are community and employers in this case. So the schools are really designed to be looking out the window rather than up to central office or Santa Fe or things like that. And so when you have that commitment to responsiveness, it's a, it's a different way of being. It's a different way of behaving, a different way of managing a school, leadership changes. Um, it's, a, it's a much different model. So how do students uh, get into this school? Are they self-selected? Do they get scholarships? Do their parents push them into it? Or, or do, do employers have certain students that they would like to? Uh, how does that part of it work? That's a, that's a great question. So the, the school is free. It's a public school. It's free. It's an option for any student in Albuquerque who's looking to um, try it. Now, the fact is that most of the young people who come to these schools are off track to graduation or have dropped down or returning okay. to school. Okay. So we teach from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. The You can come back and earn a diploma if you've dropped out and... Life, life circumstances happen. You weren't able to finish your diploma. You can come back at night. Um, well, we have students up to 24 years old that come oh, back and oh, nice. go to high school and, and get a pre-apprenticeship certificate or transition to college. Oh. So the way they find us is word of mouth, typically in the community. There's a word of mouth about the school and that it's an option um, for young people that didn't do well in traditional school. The, the other way is that um, you have a caring adult in a high school that sees young people with potential and talent, but they need another place for that to shine through. Yeah. And so we have a lot of young people that come through referrals from traditional schools where a caring adult there believes that another choice would um, serve that young person well. So if a student, say, uh, realizes that um, that the traditional classroom complicated but but not so complicated structure isn't working for him can he self-select or she self-select and go to this to these schools many of our many of our young people come because it's their choice oh, so they've decided that they want to um get back in gear in school or re-enter school and so they'll they'll come to us um on their own, and they and they'll let their parents know that they want a different choice, and so the parents will come with them after that. They're they're advocating for themselves, which is which is what we want. So when I'm looking at at at, at your video and your, and your website, I'm seeing uh, students uh, having a having a working relationship with a professional person who, apparently, I think, uh, comes from industry and acts as a mentor. And mm -hmm. I'm sure not there all the time, but but what? How does that aspect work? I think it's a fascinating thing to be able to actually apprentice yourself at a very young age mm -hmm. without all of the old-fashioned onerousness of, of what that used to mean. Mm -hmm. um, well, the schools are designed um, with uh, partnerships in mind. Mm -hmm. So we're more than encouraging partnerships. We really can't function without adults outside of school being engaged in the school. So if it's one-on-one -on -one relationships with young people or helping develop curriculum or assessing whether students have learned. So we do, we do exhibitions. So those professionals actually come and judge exhibitions and give feedback to teachers and students about whether or not the students have learned what their, what was expected or what would an industry professional see as being valuable. So they're involved in, in lots of ways. And it's a... It's the, one of the things that I've learned over the past eight years, well, really since Amy Beale, but definitely lately has been that 
the community, the professionals in this community are really want to share their experiences and their knowledge and their wisdom. And uh, we don't necessarily build our schools with a way for them to share in meaningful ways. So you might have a career day and someone might come in and speak for half an hour about what they do, but they're not really engaged in the learning that the student is doing or informing the learning. Or you might have a tutoring program where they might come after school and help with some tutoring, but that's not the same as you bringing your passion about what you do and then and then translating that to a young person or helping a young person see their own future through your experience. It's a much deeper kind of relationship and commitment. And there's a ton of goodwill in this town for schools. You know, people really want to help and they want to help in meaningful ways. We, our schools aren't necessarily designed to be able to take that. Could we have an example of what an exhibition would be, uh, say, in, in each of the three schools? So at, at Health Leadership, let's we can start there. So at Health Leadership, the uh, I went to an exhibition, let's see, it would have been I don't know, a few months ago, where students took a uh, case study of someone that went to the emergency room and they had and they did a case study of this person, a real person. They did this case study of this person and then mapped backward what the things were that led to them getting to the emergency room. Ooh. And it's not I fell down and, you know, broke my hip. It's it's um um the carpet in my house wasn't tacked down be- because I live alone and no one lives with me to help me take care of my property because my kids all live out of town. I don't drive. I needed my medication, but I'm all by myself. All of those things, all those factors mapped backward help a young person understand the circumstances that people live in and what keeps them healthy or not. So it's just a, it's a much deeper it's much more than treating someone's broken leg or it's understanding the circumstances that got people there, the determinants of what got people there, and then how the system treats them once they've gotten to the emergency room. How does the insurance system work? Um, how do you care for that person who's fallen? So, um, But the exhibition itself was about back thinking backward from the actual fall and then what were the things that led to that and thinking backward to the person's family experience, their medical history, all of those things. That's really good work. So does, um, is there a relationship between health leadership uh, high school and the University of New Mexico Medical School? Is there any, uh, is there any ease of easier access uh, uh, to getting admitted to medical school or nursing oh. school? Or, or uh, what is the relationship between, between say, a university and your students, uh, can you help place them? So the you, the relationship with UNM right now, the Health Sciences Center, is really around developing curriculum. So what should a young person know and be able to do when they graduate to be able to enter the to be enter enter the Health Sciences Center and either in nursing, uh, medical school, any of the certificate programs? What what do they need to know and be able to do? And, and what does a project-based curriculum, a good project-based curriculum look like uh-huh. to prepare them for that? So that school's only been around for, a, this is the second year, so there aren't any graduates who have transitioned to college yet. Right. But the thinking is that they're, they're deep into this idea about keeping people healthy rather than treating people after they've been sick. So... The Health Science Center is very committed to that as is First Choice and Presbyterian. And so they're thinking about how do we prepare young people to work in a new um, idea of health as opposed to providing services for people after they've gotten sick. So a lot of their work is helping us understand the new dynamic in health in healthcare, that it's about it's about performance, and performance means keeping people healthy. So it's super interesting and we wouldn't know anything if it wasn't for them teaching us about it. And then our job is to respond and build curriculum that they say is reflects the future. With the tech high school, which I know hasn't 
isn't up and running yet. But are you going to emphasize uh, uh, renewable energy, or 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 is there a or is there a much broader uh, view of that? So the the tech school right now is digging very deep into uh, the question of battery storage, hmm. which is connected to renewable energy. Yeah. So without um, effective battery storage, renewable energy is only so useful. And so when we started planning the school, we reached out to p and and we asked um, p and not about battery storage. We just said, what are you working on? What What is the most interesting work that you're doing? What's the future? And they said to us, so it's battery storage. We need, we are working on that. That's an important, um, exciting uh, element of our work right now. And so then we said, well, would you partner with us to help us develop curriculum to teach young people about battery, about battery storage? I'm, I'm to get it. And so then they have been working with us in a really deep way over the past six months or so, helping the school leader and the future um, curriculum people at the school understand what to expect in the future around this topic and then help them build curriculum that will prepare young people to understand it in a, in a deep way. The other piece of curriculum that's happening right now that is around uh, cybersecurity. And so the Stimulus Center, CNM, um, downtown, the Deep Dive Coders, those folks, and then uh, Sandia Labs and their cybersecurity um, experts are helping us think about what does good cybersecurity preparation look like? What do you need to know? And not in a, not only in the skills, but but what is the what is the environment around cybersecurity? How should you be thinking about it in a larger frame? Ethics, things like that, that need to be part of a well-rounded education. So I go to school at, at, uh, at tech leadership, mm -hmm. and I graduate uh, with a degree, uh, and my emphasis is on, is on cybersecurity. Uh, does that help me uh, get into the engineering school or whatever, or, or, or computer sciences at UNM? And... And is that experience uh, going to sort of pave the way for future work? Well, that, that's our hope. Yes. I mean, our hope is that because we're aligned well with the university and with CNM about either certificate programs or or a two year degree or a four year degree, we understand what the entry requirements are. That we we um, align ourselves backward from those entry requirements, mm -hmm. but our kids are also doing dual enrollment in their senior year, so they're getting to a taste of college in their, in the area where they'd like to study. So they get a taste of it with us holding their hand through the process. So it's a important transition opportunity that, that you're not just left at the door and hope that you survive, right? You actually yeah. get some support, you know, in that transition. This isn't the, this doesn't really sort of sound like a traditional Votech approach to things. Mm -hmm. Although I'm sure that gets confused with that. But, is there also an emphasis on basic skills, reading and writing and, and math in these high schools? Because everybody, it doesn't matter how smart they are or what school they've gone to, always has problems with that yeah. uh, because they just don't do it enough. So, so do you, uh, are your schools, do they emphasize those fundamental skills as well? It's, it's, the, it's the perfect question because... What happens typically is people think of those as trade-offs. You're either going to teach basic skills yes. or you're going to teach exciting, interesting things in school. Yes. And that you really, people think of them as um, mutually exclusive. You're either going to be, um, you know, eating your vegetables, you know, all day or you get to have dessert. It's one or the other. And it really doesn't, it really shouldn't work that way. The way it should work is that the powerful learning that's happening is building your creativity and it's building your basic skills. So you're reading and writing and doing computations that are difficult because you're doing difficult problems. You're dealing with difficult projects and that it's engaging so you're learning through the engagement. I Before I started, um, um, before I worked at Amy Bill High School, was one of the co-founders there, I used to do the public school budget for New Mexico. I worked for the legislature. Uh -huh. And so I did the appropriations work. 
I am not a good math student. Uh, no, I'm not a good traditional <laughs> math student. But you know what? It really matters <laughs> to be able to do math to do to do the budget. It's it's a very important in context to learn math. Proportions, um, ratios, standard deviation, all those kinds of things are part of budget building. And I learned it because it really mattered to me to learn it. Yeah. I didn't learn it um, in a traditional school setting. Right. So um, in that way, I, w I wouldn't compare myself to our students necessarily, but in that way, I identify with the way that they engage in school. And so I learned some basic things, but I learned it because it was in context of something super powerful, important, and interesting. As a journalist uh, for over 50 years. I never went to journalism school. I, huh. I'm an anthropology major. But uh, you learn, you know, you learn in a newsroom real quick. You're highly motivated. Uh, you're beaten around the head and ears <laughs> by your editors and stuff. But this, this whole idea of learning because you want to, yeah. being there voluntarily, suddenly everything opens up and changes, I think. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of, say, making a writing assignment uh, for kids who are asked to write about things they don't particularly care about. How are you going to possibly get anybody to write well on, yeah. you know, in that circumstance? I've been teaching for almost 40 years, and, and uh, it always has to be based on a kind of interior desire. Uh, it's not even voluntary. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's compelled. I want to know this, and if I don't know how to do this, then I won't, then I won't know how to do that. And that mm -hmm. kind of sounds like like what you've done is you've taken a a, a kind of a, a sort of a, an old world view of Votech and turned it into something that is a way to uh, catalyze curiosity about everything else. Mm -hmm. um, is that? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that the challenge with, um, there are a couple of challenges with traditional vocational technical education. One is that it gives you a skill set that is going to be obsolete. So uh, an, a, that skill set is is not the skill set that's going to keep you employed and prosperous through your life. The skill set that keeps you employed and prosperous is the ability to think and adapt. Yeah. That's what makes you successful. Yeah. And so the school is committed to the thinking and creativity and adaptable skills that it takes to be successful. So that's just a really practical thing about vocational ed that I think is is missing. The second thing is that the most interesting and sophisticated projects in this town are in the real world. And so if you ask a contractor what they do every day, it's incredible the level of problem solving that happens on a job site or in a design studio, or you go to a clinic and watch the medical people work with clients. I mean, that is some super sophisticated problem solving that happens. And it's deep, complex problem solving. It's not the kind of rote learning that happens in traditional school. And so if you can bring that those kind of experiences into school, then you can hope for deep learning um, by young people. And that's really the goal is to give them really sticky, challenging, interesting problems that are multifaceted, reflect real life, and adults who actually know how to solve them working with you um, to learn about it. So if this is a free school, how do you all get funded? Uh, and do you see any obstacles in the future to, to uh, uh, sustaining your operations? Mm -hmm. So because the school is a public school, it's funded on a per-student basis by the state. By the state. Right. So the school operates like a, similar to a school district in, the, in that the funding comes directly to the school. Wow. And it's on a per-student basis, <clears throat> and it funds the operating costs for um, the students who go there. Wow. Uh, a big challenge is uh, capital. So how do you build a building? So there is some money for building, but, it's, but you don't have the power to bond. And you don't have the which which limits your ability to use property tax revenues and to forward fund projects. So that's a that's a challenge. Um, but in in general, it's funded by the state. One of the um, biggest challenges is actually starting the school because there's no startup funding. 
So you're really on your own to to raise the money that it takes to be able to um, create the school. So we've been super lucky in that we've had some foundations. They're willing to support the the startup costs yeah. for the schools. It's not as it's not as much as we need. It's not as much as you would get if you're in a traditional school, but it's enough to get the to get the doors open and, and get working. So if I'm a young person or a young person's parent and I want to get uh, in touch with your organization, how do I how do I do it? So we you could go to the Leadership High School uh, website. Um, and so just do a search leadership high schools in Albuquerque, and then our website would come up and you could, um, and there's, a um, information about each of the schools and application online. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm really grateful for it. And, uh, I've learned a lot and, and, uh, we'll keep our eyes open about this place in the future. Thank you. It's great to be here.